Stephanie Lazarus. Stephanie effing Lazarus. Any other cars that stand out in your mind? Hmm. I'd have to say one of my most top favorite bizarre interviews to watch. Definitely up there with Jody Arias. Now, when I say bizarre, I don't mean like weird. Like, you know how Jody Arias was doing handstands, singing, and all that type of demonic stuff while she was in the interrogation room. But Stephanie Lazarus, she's a woman who lies between her teeth. And it's just so hilarious to see her get caught up in her lies. It is so satisfying to see them unravel and see them get caught up and tripped up and basically exposed. And if you've not seen the Stephanie Lazarus interrogation video, I'm gonna stop you right now. Go watch it. You have to watch it for context. I made a video reacting to it a couple weeks ago. I'll link it somewhere below and come back to this video afterwards because I'm gonna go into details. What happened between Stephanie Lazarus and her victim, Sherry Rasmussen? What happened to Stephanie Lazarus post verdict? And where is Stephanie Lazarus now? This is a woman who bit her victim in the middle of their struggle. Who the hell does that? Some damn wild animal. You know, I don't... Stephanie Lazarus was charged and convicted of first degree murder in the shooting of Sherry Rasmussen. Sherry Rasmussen was the wife of her former lover, John Rutten. So I want you to remember those three names because those are the three key people in this case. We have the clown, Stephanie Lazarus. We have the victim, Sherry Rasmussen. And we have John Rutten. So Stephanie and John were dating casually, although John Rutten, I think to this day, has not still said that they were never boyfriend, girlfriend. They were dating through college. It was casual and he was never really committed to her. But at some point, he finds someone that he really loves. And that's Sherry Rasmussen. Well, upon finding out about the engagement, Stephanie Lazarus freaked the fuck out. Top bizarre things about this case. One, the bite that I've already mentioned. Two, the crime happened in 1986, but it was not solved until almost 30 years later in 2009. Three, Stephanie Lazarus was LAPD. And that bite, well, that bite came and bit her in the ass later on because that was the bite that left the DNA mark on Cherry Rasmussen and they kept that in the evidence room. Now with all the DNA forensics, they were able to find out that the DNA belonged to Stephanie Lazarus. One of her coworkers had took one of the cups that she disposed and tested for her DNA and it was a match. She was charged, convicted, early 2010s, and then here she is trying to appeal. <laughs> Let's go through it. At the trial, the prosecution established that Stephanie had been in love with Rutten and was emotionally devastated when she learned of his and Rasmussen's 1985 engagement. She went to Rutten's in tears, begging him to reconsider, and later confronted Rasmussen at work, and were discharged from a gun similar to the one owned by Stephanie, which she declared stolen two weeks ago after the shooting. Oh my god, that sounds like Jody Arias right there. Now, they're not going to go away quietly after this. Her and her lawyers, they're going to put in an appeal, and they're going to say that, hey, we have some issues with the trial. Let's go over it really quick. One, the pre-accusation delay violated her due process right. So the detectives, they already had her as a suspect, but when they had the DNA evidence, it confirmed it. A DNA swap, would you be willing to give us one? Maybe. Two, the trial court erred in denying a defense motion to quash search warrants in Stephanie Lazar's home and computers. Mm, okay. Three, the trial court erred in denying a defense motion to traverse the search warrants. Four, the trial court aired in admitting a tape of Appellant's pre-arrest interview by LAPD detectives. I'm so glad that they released that to the public. <laughs> Five, the trial court aired in failing to hold a Kelly hearing before admitting evidence of partial DNA profiles from materials found on the victim's fingernail. Six, the trial court aired by failing to allow the defense to introduce evidence for burglary that occurred in the area six weeks after the murder. So number five basically says that there was other DNA evidence underneath Sherry Rasmussen's fingernails. And number six, they were like, well, you know, there was like burglaries going around the area around the time of Rasmussen's death. So maybe it was them. Maybe Stephanie's not culpable for this. Yeah, we'll see about that. Now, this appeal paperwork goes into more details about what happened the day that Sherry Rasmussen was found in her apartment. Evidence at trial. So I tried to find uh, videos or maybe even like court transcripts of the trial, but I wasn't able to get a hold of it. And it really does go into detail. So this is pretty good enough. On February 24th, 1986, Rasmussen, this is after she was married to her husband, John Rutten, by the way. I think this was like about like a month after they were married or a couple months. Rasmussen lived in a condominium on Balboa Street in Van Nuys with her husband, John Rutten, worked as a nurse at Glendale Hospital. Rutten, the husband, left for work at 7.20 that morning. Rasmussen had called in sick. Both Rutten and Rasmussen's sister had tried to call Rasmussen at home several times that day, beginning at 10 a.m., but she never answered. At approximately 9.45, a neighbor, Anastasia Volantis, I don't know how to pronounce that, Volantis, 
noticed the garage to the Rasmussen's condominium was open, no cars inside. When Rutten returned at 6 o'clock p.m., he noticed the garage door was open and Rasmussen's BMW was missing. There was broken glass in the driveway from the shattering sliding glass patio door and the door to the condominium to the garage, which Rutten had closed and locked when he left that morning, was open jar. Uh, Rasmussen was lying on the living room floor. She was still wearing her sleep shirt and her robe. The pathologist that examined Sherry Rasmussen's body uh, declared that the cause was three gunshots to the chest and all of them were fatal. They had found abrasions on Sherry Rasmussen's wrist consistent with injury from a rope and a cord. Like, what, what was Stefan Lazarus trying to do? Like, try to stage a kidnapping? She had multiple contusions, lacerations, abrasions all over her hands, mouth, face, head, and neck. And they had found an injury on Sherry Rasmussen's face that was consistent with the blow from the of a gun. They also claimed that there was a blow to Sherry Rasmussen's head that was consistent with the broken vase that was found near the body. And then also additionally, on Sherry Rasmussen's inner forearm, there was a bite mark. A bite mark. Honestly, after watching Stefan Lazarus' interview, I could totally see her doing the bite mark. The presence of multiple bullet holes, gunshot residue on the quilt led authorities and experts to conclude that it had been wrapped around the assailant's weapons to dampen the sound of gunshots. I thought that doesn't work. I thought that was just like a thing that you see in movies, but it actually doesn't work in real life. I don't know. I watched a YouTube video on it and apparently it doesn't work, especially if you use like a pillow to try to silence your gun. Now, one of the major reasons why Stefan Lazarus wasn't caught right away, although I don't see how, why not? Because a lot of people were pointing fingers at her. Makes sense, right? The jealous ex-girlfriend who wanted to be with the guy, but she didn't get the guy at the end. These people are pointing at you for whatever reason. <laughs> I don't know why. That's just crazy. I mean, that's just, that's absolutely crazy. Even the victim's family was pointing fingers at her and even John Rutten as well. But the LAPD, they closed the case because they deemed that it was a burglary gone wrong. Now, at the crime of the scene, stereo equipment had been pulled from the cabinet inside the condominium's living room and stacked by the door to the garage. It makes no sense. A drawer in the living room table had been pulled out and the contents dumped on the floor. Although there's no evidence of forced entry, the rooms containing other valuables, including additional stereo equipment, were undisturbed. The detectives who initially investigated, um, they concluded that it was committed in the course of a burglary. Uh, specifically, they theorized that one or two burglars have came in through the door, they were surprised by Rasmussen's presence, and they had shot her over a struggle over a gun. There are also other theories out there that since Stefan Lazarus was LAPD, they were saying LAPD was covering it up. Or maybe Stefan Lazarus was trying to do things behind the scenes to cover up her track. I'm surprised she didn't try to make her way into the evidence room and try to get rid of that bite mark sample. Man, she must have been sweating because in December 2004, members of LAPD cold case unit reopened the case, asking the coroner's office to locate the bite mark tissue sample, which had been in the freeze in the coroner's evidence room since 1986. Uh, in 05, sorry, 2005, Jennifer Francis, a criminologist with LAPD, she examined a piece of one of the swabs and found that there was DNA on there. Now, she found that it was a DNA profile that belonged to a female. So in 2009, the investigation turned towards specific women who might have reason to harm Rasmussen. The LAPD officer surreptitiously obtained a sample of Stefan Lazar's DNA by getting possession of her drinking cup and straw that she discarded. Now, if you remember during her interview in 2009, she was asked towards the end of the interrogation. Well, to her, she didn't know it was interrogation at the time, but she must have knew in her gut feeling, right? You, you must have known. Like, how are you LAPD for 25 years and not realize that you're really being interrogated? Okay, don't get me wrong. You're right. I have been doing this a long time. Yeah. And, and I wish I had been recording this. But uh, towards the end, uh, they tried to ask her for her DNA swap, and she was like, no. And they were like, mm, okay, okay, sure. But, you know, they end up getting it anyways. Aside from the scene of the crime, I don't know why I keep saying crime on the scene, but aside from the scene of the crime, there are other factors. There were other factors that contribute to evidence against Stefan Lazarus. Let's talk about this event right here. So in 1986, Stefan Lazarus was already LAPD officer. Uh, she actually got into the police academy in 1983 and graduated in 1984. What's oh, only one year for the police academy? I don't know. Anyways, uh, <laughs> uh, so Brian McCartan, who attended the academy with Stefan Lazarus, described her as the most strongest, most aggressive, most persistent fighter of the women in the class. Mm. Her level of strength with respect to other women as superior. Now, just to keep in mind, Sherry Rasmussen was over six feet tall. She was also very athletic and I'm sure she was pretty strong as well. Like when you're a nurse, sometimes you have to lift up heavy bodies. So you definitely got to get some strength. They also testified that Stefan Lazarus was a expert shooter. However, Stefan Lazarus showed her friend and fellow officer lock picking tools and that she had learned how to use them. Hmm, is you know what? They did say that Sherry Rasmussen's apartment, there was no signs of breaking and entering. So 
<laughs> Daphne Lazarus, being the crazy person that she is, most likely picked the lock. But can you imagine doing that in broad daylight? Like, what if you get caught? That's so embarrassing. Not like she would care, though. Also, in 1986, they said it was common for LAPD officers to carry a backup weapon, uh, which was issued to them by the department. So the interesting thing about this backup weapon, uh, well, Stephen Lazarus, two weeks after Sherry Rasmussen's death, she had reported that her gun was stolen from the glove compartment of her car in Santa Monica. However, this story is not consistent to what she told other people. I believe at the time she also told her roommate or someone days before the gun was apparently stolen that she was carrying a bag or a fanny pack and I guess it must have just fell out. She asked him how to go about reporting it and then when the appellant reported her gun stolen in Santa Monica, she told the officer at the front desk that it had been stolen that day. Uh, there was no record indicating a penalty report of the theft to the LAPD armorer. So we're going to rewind things back a little bit. We're going to go back to the time when Stefan Lazarus and John Rutten were dating and what happened when John Rutten decided to date Sherry Rasmussen. Stefan Lazarus and John Rutten, they had met in college, dated casually in the late 1970s. After graduation between 1981 and 1984, they continued to date and they were sexually intimate. But Rutten didn't consider her as a girlfriend. Oof, must have been a blow to her. In June 1984, Rutten had met Rasmussen. This just reminds me of Jodi Ayers so much, where Jodi was dating Travis Alexander. Then Travis was like, oh, I'm good. Travis was seeing other people, but at the same time, he was sexually intimate with Jodi. And you know what? I, I'm, I'm, I guarantee you that Jodi Arias and Stefan Lazarus, they were just trying to play at the cool girl. Like, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm like the cool girl. I don't care. You can sleep with other people, you know? Mm, but you know, behind the scenes, they're probably seething. Not gonna lie, though. I tried to play cool girl once, and that shit, that shit sucks. <laughs> it sucks. Fuck that. To all you young people out there, don't play the cool girl. It's not worth it. So in May of 1985, John Rutten and Rasmussen, they had become engaged. In June of 1985, Stefan Lazarus found out about the engagement, called him upset and crying. She asked John Rutten to come to her condo at the time. When he arrived, the scene was a mess. Stefan Lazarus was crying. She was telling John that she was in love with him and then repeatedly asked him to have sex with her. Following this encounter, Rutten continued his relationship with Rasmussen and several weeks later, they moved in together. Sometime after Rutten and Rasmussen were living together, Stefan Lazarus went to the hospital where Sherry Rasmussen had worked at and confronted her. They had a verbal altercation. And of course that evening, Sherry Rasmussen, she is so visibly upset. She goes home, she goes to vent to her fiance and John Rutten was like, you know what? I, I have a confession to make, you know, that time when she called me and I went over to her condo, well, I had sex with her. And so Rutten had promised Sherry Rasmussen that he was never gonna have any more contact with Stephanie. They went on and continued to marry in November of 1985. So Stephanie Lazarus had told her roommate that she was in love with John. On one occasion while they were roommates sometimes between 1984 and 1985, she woke up her roommate in the middle of the night. She was crying. She wanted her roommate to console her. She had told him that, oh, John had broken up with me and is going to marry someone else. That's like red flags right there. Also, Stephanie became really sad, easily upset after the breakup. Uh, she also told the roommate that she had went to Sherry Rasmussen's place of work and confronted her. When discussing why she did not date for an extended period after the breakup, Stephanie Lazarus told her roommate that she was picky and preferred men who were tall and athletic like John. After Stephanie Lazarus was arrested, they had a search warrant and they went into her house. They found journals, daily planners, some photos of John Rudden still, even though at the time he was already married. The journal covered the period between November 1984 and August 1986. So this is before and after Rasmussen's death. Um, an entry for November 1984 discussed the night that kept my mind off John for a while anyway. And then there was an entry for April 1985 stated the appellant saw John Rutten's car, put a note on it, watched it for one and a half hour and check up on it a few times. Dude, she was obsessive. An entry for May 1985 mentioned visiting Rutten and his girlfriend being there. An entry for 1985 stated the appellant, Stephanie, had found out Rutten was getting married. She described herself as being very depressed and her concentration was negative 10. Listen, if the guy that you're interested in has moved in with his girlfriend, they're obviously at the stage of their relationship where things are starting to get serious. Another entry for June 85 says that Stephanie Lazarus didn't feel like working, too stressed out about John, had a hard time concentrating these days, so I caught up and said I didn't feel well, could have a TO, I think that's time off, they gave it to me. 
Uh, there was no journal entry from March 1986 or any other time mentioning that her gun had been stolen. You know, I think for Jody Ayers, they also went through her journal entries too. In August of 1985, Stephanie Lazarus wrote to John's mother telling her that she was truly in love with John and the past year had really torn her up. The letter further stated, I wish it hadn't ended the way it did and I don't think I'll ever understand John's decision. Uh, in December 1985, Stephanie Lazarus received a letter from John Runton's mom in her journal that made her very, very, very sad. On the day of Sherry Rasmussen's death, where was Stephanie Lazarus? She was off work. She was been working that day. And not only she was off that day, but she was off the three days afterwards. Now let's talk about what happened after Sherry Rasmussen's death. Did her and John ever get back together? Did she finally get what she wanted or did she end up doing all this for no damn reason? Rutten saw Stephen Lazarus in 1989, so roughly three years afterwards. Uh, they were both in Hawaii on vacation with other people. He saw her two or three times afterwards and they had a sexual relations. They were never in a relationship. This is what I don't get. Why did Stephanie Lazarus do all of this? Why do this if you're not even gonna end up with the guy anyways? I mean, it says right here that she backed off after Rasmussen's death. Now, they were able to examine Stefan Lazarus' computer. They found, how did they even go back this far? But they found that on her computer, she had performed searches of John Rutten's name in April 1998, in May 1999, and December 1999. That's like, that's like 10 years later. Good God. <laughs> Does she not delete her internet history? Or I guess they can still recover it, even though your internet history is clear, I guess, right? Now, I want to jump to this part of the document right here because this just reaffirms what I said earlier. People had suspicions that it was Stephanie Lazarus. One, after the death of Rasmussen, Rutten informed investigators that Stephanie was his former girlfriend. Two, Sherry Rasmussen's father told investigators that Rasmussen had been threatened by her husband's former girlfriend. Three, Rasmussen's parents advised him to investigate Stephanie Lazarus. I do want to jump ahead and talk about the burglaries that were going on in Sherry Rasmussen's neighborhood because the burglaries were the reason why they thought that Sherry Rasmussen was involved in a burglary gone wrong. During opening statements, defense counsel indicated his intention to present evidence of a burglary that occurred in Rasmussen's neighborhood in April 86. The court subsequently warned counsel there would have to be remarkable similarities before evidence could come in and question why this matter had not been resolved prior to trial. The next day, the prosecution filed a motion to exclude third-party culpability evidence. The moving papers contended the April burglary was markedly different from the crime at issue, and there was no direct or circumstantial evidence linking any third person to Rasmussen's murder. According to police reports on April 11, 1986, six weeks after the murder, a residential burglary occurred on Balboa Boulevard over a mile from Rasmussen's condominium. The victim's condominium was similar to Rasmussen's in which both had locked security gates and stairs leading from the garages to the condominiums. The victim, Lisa Ravalli, told the detectives that she had been home all day during the burglary due to an illness. Someone rang her doorbell several times that morning. She looked out the people and saw an unfamiliar... Saw an unfamiliar... Saw an unfamiliar... Unfamiliar... Where can I find it? And saw an unfamiliar... And saw an unfamiliar... Unfamiliar and saw an unfamiliar, I think it's because an and un is, yeah, that's just confusing, okay? Saw an unfamiliar Hispanic male. She did not open the door when she had left later in the day, the younger Hispanic male in the blue station wagon seemed to be watching her. Uh, when she returned, her front door had been forced open. Standing at the threshold, she saw the Hispanic male who had been sitting in the blue cart, now putting stereo equipment uh, by the garage stairs into the bag. He ran past her out the front door and a security gate. A second Hispanic male came downstairs carrying a gun, described by the victim by a 38 with a four inch barrel. Uh, Rivali had turned and ran. The armed burglar also ran. Rivali observed paper stuffed in the locks of the outside security doors, apparently placed there to keep the door from locking shut. Many items on the upper floor of the condominium has been rifled and disturbed, including a typewriter. Oh my god, a typewriter! Oh, he's on typewriters! Uh, a jewelry box, a dresser, a hope chest. The hope chest. Oh, it's one of those chests that like opens up like this, like in Beauty and the Beast. The culprits escaped with some of Rivali's jewelry. The trial court concluded the evidence did not meet the standard for third-party culpability evidence and excluded it. The court found similar certainties, similarities, including the killing took place in daytime and the April burglary was a daytime crime. Their equipment was involved in both crimes <laughs> and so was a gun, okay? However, the court found the differences uh, prevailed. The burglars forced their way inside. Rasmussen's home showed no sign of forced entry. Uh, the burglars ransacked Rivali's bedroom, took jewelry. Rasmussen's home showed no evidence of intruder sought jewelry. 
The burglars left Revali's home in their own vehicle. Rasmussen's assailant left in hers. Finally, the burglars, upon being discovered by Revali, fled without discharging a weapon. Rasmussen's assailant brutally beat her. Okay, again, with the vase, with the barrel, with the gun, and there was other marks as well. Bit her, which definitely seems like a personal, and then shot her to death. Uh, the court found the critical feature to be nothing linked to the suspects in the April burglary to Rasmussen's homicide. It's so funny how they were like, oh yeah, you know, these are such similar, you know, because, um, well, there was a stereo equipment that was involved, and there was a gun that was involved. <laughs> so, what happened to Stephen Lazarus' appeal? Well, you bet to find it right now. Don't worry, spoiler alert, she's not like roaming the streets free right now or anything. Certain facts are largely uncontradicted at trial and were demonstrated through the introduction of evidence whose admission is not challenged on appeal. The appellant, deeply in love with Rutten, love how they use that, was devastated by his decision to marry Rasmussen, more like deeply obsessively in love, okay? B, the appellant directed her anger not at Rutten, but at Rasmussen, uh, confronting her at her place of work. And C, the appellant's DNA was in the saliva of the bite mark inflicted on Rasmussen's forearm at the time of her uh, passing. Uh, these facts alone raise the nearly inescapable inference that appellant confronted, assaulted, and murdered Rasmussen. Appellant does not claim the decades long delay in matching her DNA that found in her bite mark was intentionally designed to secure a tactical advantage and showing of prejudice was minimal. We discern no error in the trial court's determination that substantial justification for the delay outweighed any marginal prejudice demonstrated by appellant and that she failed to establish a violation of her due process rights. I do have a question though. If you're prosecuted, oh, sorry, if you're convicted of a crime, especially of a crime as heinous as murder, can anyone just appeal or do you have to meet certain thresholds in order to appeal? So like, for example, from when I learned about the Johnny Depp and Amber Heard trial, it's like, well, not anyone can just appeal the verdict to try to delay the, uh, the payment process because, you know, like in Virginia, you have to post the bond amount, which is the verdict amount plus interest, 6% and yada, yada, yada. So I, I wonder how it is with... Um, Appeals for uh, murder trials. I gotta look that up. Stephanie's obsession with Rutten and desire to continue the relationship supported the inference that she would have returned items relating to him, including photographs uploaded to a computer. In any event, the trial court found the officers conducting the searches relied in good faith upon the issuance of the warrants. So Stephanie's interview statements were voluntarily made in the course of what any officer in her position would have recognized as a criminal investigation. Damn, that jab, man. She should have watched. Because uh, I know how this stuff works. Sure. I mean, I, I... She said, I know how this stuff works. Yeah, she's been talking for an hour and seven minutes. If Bruce Rivers was reacting to Seven Lazarus, he would have been like, yep, she self-snitched. She damn done his self-snitch herself. We expressly reject the appellant's suggestion that a law officer enforcement uh, question in course of criminal investigation is automatically entitled to use immunity for statements voluntary made. Finally, the trial court acted well within its discretion in rejecting appellant's pre-offered evidence of third-party culpability based on the burglary of another condominium six weeks after Rasmussen's murder. The circumstances of that burglary in which the intruders waited for the occupant to leave, force entry, Stole jewelry, and upon being detected, fled in their own vehicle, not in Cherry Rasmussen's BMW, differed radically from those of a distant uh, instant crime, where the assailant gained unforced access to the residence while the occupant was home, took no jewelry, but assaulted, bludgeoned, and shot the victim to death before leaving the victim's car. For similar reasons, appellant demonstrated neither a violation of her state or federal constitutional rights, nor evidentiary error in the trial court's ruling. Uh, precluding her from cross-examining the prosecution's crime scene expert on the unrelated burglary. The judgment... Oh, let me show you this part right here. The judgment is affirmed. Goodbye. Goodbye, Stephen Lazarus. May you rot in jail for many more years. When was this? This was in... Oh, God. Oh, Lord. Lazarus filed a lengthy appeal for conviction in May 2013. The California Court of Appeals, 2nd District, Division 4, which has appellate jurisdiction over Los Angeles 